guys, it's Reagan and welcome to the start of another reading vlog. This reading vlog is exciting and hopefully very fruitful in both page number and uh, discovery at the end of it because this is no regular reading vlog. This is a reading vlog dedicated to science and discovery. I'm kidding. But essentially this is the first vlog in which I'm going to be deep diving a romanticy author in hopes of finding my own personal repertoire of favorite romanticy books out there. But because this video has a bit more setup than usual, let's sit down together and chat about my logic, my reasoning, my thought process, my scientific approach, if you will. So the concept of this video and the hope of this video is to begin to narrow down and discover romanticy authors that I love. I am a reader who loves all genres. I also love romance and obviously I'm a big reviewer of fantasy on my channel. However though I feel like in the past year and a half I have not been able to really find the romanticy books for me. I've read quite a few of them and I often leave the experience not really loving exactly what I've read and not necessarily because they're bad though some of them are bad, but more so because the style of writing really wasn't what I was looking for. So I decided to, you know, let's do more research. Let's clearly define what it is I want and try to narrow down and figure out maybe a subgenre within romanticy that's more suited for me. And I apologize for the ramble ahead. Essentially, I decided to go to the root of what I love about romance in general, and I'm a historical romance girly. I love propriety, I love longing, I love drawn out and dramatic pacing, and thinking about the fantasy books that have romance that I've enjoyed, especially in the past, like Daughter of the Forest, The Beautiful Ones, A River Enchanted, all of these fantasy books that have a strong romantic element, in my opinion, lean more in the historical romance style. Whereas some of the romantic books that I have read um, and I didn't like as much, I think have more traditional contemporary romance tropes. And that's kind of when I had an aha moment. I think what's happening is I'm picking up romanticy novels, expecting them to kind of have this very lyrical, romantic, fairy tale quality to it with the romance tropes of historical romance because of the maybe semi-historical setting of like a medieval high fantasy world. But that's not always the case and obviously writers are allowed to infuse whatever tropes or styles they want within their stories but I think realizing that maybe this is where my personal disconnect is will help me distill down what authors are personally for me. So then from there I went on an internet deep dive, read so many different romantic uh, romanticy reviews, and looked for specific keywords that called out to me. And here friends brings us to our first author I'm going to read and review for this channel because I feel like based on the criteria that I sort of just chatted through they will maybe be an author that I will enjoy. The author I'm going to be featuring in this vlog is called Grace Draven, and she has a few different romanticy series and I'm going to be reading hopefully at least three of her books for this video. I can get a sense of her style, figure out if it's for me, let you guys know what I think so you can figure out if it's for you. I also feel like she seems to be a well-known writer but at the same time she's not so famous where I see her books everywhere are really talked about. Like this was kind of a again, more of a subgenre. For this vlog, I'm going to start out with the Fallen Empire series, the first one being Phoenix Unbound. This is said to be enemies to lovers. And I feel like on the spectrum of fantasy and romance, all of these books are going to lean more in the romance direction, which again is fine. But I've also heard good things about this author's world building and just character pacing. She also has a sort of wizard apprentice grumpy series called Master of Crows, which came out a while ago. Um, so I'll be reading and reviewing this one as well. So welcome to the start of this vlog and welcome to the first vlog of me trying to figure out what romanticy I like because I feel like recently I've just been reading romanticy books that I've just been not liking and reviewing rather harshly on my channel which is fine that happens but I also want to have like true romanticy books that I can recommend with my full heart you know what I mean so so begins the experiment sitting down now and I'm gonna actually start book one that I'm featuring, which is The Phoenix Unbound, part of the Fallen Empire series. Hi friends, I have a reading update and a bit more information about the first book I'm reading, which is The Phoenix Unbound, for any who have forgotten. So I read a quick 40 pages of this book and I have to say, I'm reading it fast. It's definitely giving me the energy, like the speed at which I'm reading this book is definitely giving me the energy I feel 
when I'm reading a romance book that I'm into where I'm just like which is nice because I don't always feel that when I've been picking up romanticy recently um so the setup of this book is that it's set in this really brutal empire kind of roman inspired i would imagine because they are the empire itself is rich and powerful and incredibly violent both of our main characters are trapped by this empire in different ways our first main character we're introduced to is named galene and basically in this empire every year every town that's controlled by this larger empire is required to send a tithe in the form of a young woman to the empire to be killed as a sacrifice to the gods but also killed in a spectacle where in which people are entertained by it they're also provided as rewards to the gladiators that exist in this world and the gladiators are basically also forced to fight other people to the death for the rest of their lives until they die so they are also um, in forced captivity as well. Um, Galeen has been traveling to the Empire for the past five years. She has been able to do this because she actually has magic and she's able to change her appearance. So every year she comes to the Empire as a different looking woman, protecting all the other girls that live in her town and village. And she basically survives the ceremony where she's supposed to die. And then she slips back to her town to repeat this horror over and over and over again. And then our other main character is named Azorian and he's basically been forced to be a gladiator for the past 10 years he was trapped and taken away from his home village and he's basically been living a spectacle of violence and harm for the past decade and he noticed for the past few years that this woman has been coming disguising her identity and seemingly no one else noticed but him and at the beginning of the book he basically blackmails her to help him escape um, right off the bat, a couple things I'm enjoying is the writing style. The tone and how the story is presented feels like it's written in a fantasy way. And I like that. Like it's capturing the vibe and the atmosphere of a fantasy book. And I want to emphasize this because sometimes I do feel like I pick up romanticy and it reads like contemporary fiction, but just in a fantasy world. One or the other is not bad. I just personally really do enjoy like a classic sort of fantasy vibe to the writing style to a reading from both of the perspectives of the main characters which I like because I do feel like it allows me to care and understand the emotions of both of our characters right away which I appreciate um I will say for having already read 40 pages like I feel like the author has really gripped my attention fast like I am compelled by both of these characters this is a dark dangerous brutal world a terrible and evil empire that both of these characters are trying to survive in I also appreciate that there's this sort of blackmailing situation like they both don't like each other at the beginning of this book but it's not founded necessarily in a power imbalance like they're both powerful in their own ways and they're also both desperate and being taken advantage of in their own ways so like they see the other person as a resource but mostly because they really have like no other choice like azarian is using Galeen because he literally like he has been trapped for 10 years forced to fight for entertainment and also entertain this horrible woman called the Empress and he wants out and he also wants to destroy this empire and obviously Galeen has her own desires as well and so like they have this back and forth immediately obviously because they have their own interests that they're trying to protect which I like but yeah I've only read 40 pages but so far I have been pulled in pretty quickly like this to me vibe wise i know i'm talking really soon there's a lot of this book left to read it's like it really was the realization that i've been craving romance setup of historical romance setup but in a fantasy world and setting i'm curious to see the rest of the world this is a series so i'm excited to see like the rest of the world building i think this does have battles and politics so i'm not sure how that will play out and like how well written that will be but i'll let you know but the first 40 pages so far have been pretty good. I read it pretty fast. I made some miso soup for lunch. So I'm gonna sit down and enjoy this now and then do some more reading. And I'll keep y'all posted with my thoughts and feelings. Hello friends, it's time for an afternoon cup of coffee. So I'm gonna sit down and do some reading. I'm procrastinating from everything I actually need to do. But that's okay, you know? I mean, is it? Don't worry about it. I'll worry about it later. Hello, I'm here with another reading update of the Phoenix Unbound. I've read 30% of this book and I'm happy to report on a very surface level element of this review. I'm reading this book 
really fast. Like, it's definitely pulled me in. I'm very interested. Finding the character dynamics be very interesting. Like, obviously it's very trope-reliant. Obviously, this isn't the most groundbreaking piece of literature I've ever read, but transparently when I'm picking up romance or romanticy, like, I just want to be entertained, first and foremost. I want to just fall headfirst into a story, be entertained by the romance, believe the tension, believe the angst, believe the frustration, not be too distracted by the fantasy world or pleasantly surprised by the fantasy world. And if the author can achieve that, I'm generally good. Recently though, I haven't had that success, but so far 30% into this book, I'm really liking this. First and foremost, I really like the drama and dynamic between our two main characters, Galeen and Azorian. A lot of people say enemies to lovers. It is, but it's more like circumstantial enemies. So there's a lot of distrust, a lot of dislike, but it's not like they have this like prolonged reason to hate each other or like historical reasons to hate each other. It's more like they, one character is being used by the other for their freedom. And so like circumstances have just occurred in such a way where they don't like each other and they don't trust each other, which still works to great success. There's also like a lot of forced proximity, a lot of like even scenes, I've read some scenes of like having to like fake be married and it's just so entertaining. But I think at the core of it, the author has very quickly made me like our two main characters. Alongside of that, we have this fantasy world, obviously this evil empire. We have this empire trying to track down both of these characters, particularly Azorian, because he's this famed gladiator that's been captive for 10 years. We also obviously have their terrible rule that has existed for a long time. There's lots of folklore and stories associated with this. There's also like magic in this world, a lot of hidden magic in this world. And Azorian, I think, comes from some sort of line of power because he is also determined to like regain his birthright. I feel like this is a very character focused story, but where the author needs to explain the world and explain the magic or create a moment of tension or fear for our characters to have to work through and survive, she does a really good job like writing and describing things in a way that doesn't feel info dumpy and also really colors in the landscape that these characters are interacting in. Again, I'm reading this book for the romance, but I've also been pleasantly surprised by the fantasy aspect of this. I'm excited to learn more about Galeen's magic and how that works and just like their tension that spikes and goes down. It's just like very, very, very entertaining and I'm into it. I'm into it. It also has like kind of a quest aspect because they're fleeing across this empire. They're being pursued, they're being chased, they have to disguise themselves. So it ha there's just so many different things and it's creating a lot of entertainment value for me. And again, 30% of the way through, so far so good. Millie's doing her best spring time vibes, hanging out outside as she deserves, as she wants. She's just, you know, the sunshine queen. Work is done. It's a beautiful day outside and I have successfully convinced Clay to go get conveyor belt sushi. So we're gonna do that now and I could not be more excited. So cheers, let's leave. Ooh. Tell them our plate count so far. 14. 14. How high will this go? We got prizes. <laughs> it's hard to open. Oh, yeah. I got a Spy X family magnet. I'm trying the viral confetti cake dipped cone now as an after dinner treat. Cheers. Hi, I am back from dinner. And I have been reading The Phoenix Unbound, and I'm really liking this book. <laughs> Something I really appreciate that this author's doing, well, there's actually quite a few things. One, I'm really enjoying reading from both of our point of views, and the male point of view is not just a guy ogling our female main character, thinking about her, not pounce on her at any moment because she's just so dang attractive. In fact, they very much have their own distinct thoughts, distinct personalities, and their own demons and pain from the past. Again, I just feel like these two characters actually feel like distinct fantasy characters that work well within this series. They're not like 
walking tropes or caricatures of like romantic -y characters that you often run into. So anyway, only positive things to say so far. But before we do more reading, we're gonna watch Happily Ever After, 90 Day Fiance, and play some Stardew Valley, obviously. Excuse the apron, I'm in the midst of cooking lunch, but I wanted to go where my Kindle was charging because we're gonna have some serious reading later. I'm on page 250, I'm 60, 2% done with the Phoenix Unbound. I'm loving this book. I was not expecting to like this book as much as I am. I also was not expecting to be so impressed with the fam the fantasy dynamics of this book that, that I am, but truly it's the relationship pacing that is so working for me. I won't deny the start of this book is rather grim and the author has topics that are included in this that are very, very dark, but I do feel like there's a lot of empathy and care, particularly between the two main characters in the way that they come from very different places, but they've both had to face insurmountable hardship. And despite the fact that they have a lot of conflict between each other, there is never anything less than empathy and compassion for what they both have suffered. And that is true through the entirety of the book. And the amount of mutual respect, like there is clearly going to be a romance in this book, but it's not romance that's like, wow, that person's so hot. I find them so attractive. And that's the start of it. It's formed through like understanding, getting to know each other, mutual respect. And then like, just like two people drawn to each other, like through these connections. And it's so beautiful. <laughs> and watching the whole thing unfurl and just like, the pining, the yearning, and the complications that's still present between these two characters persists. And like, I could not be more grateful. <laughs> I like them individually. I like them together. I am still on the edge of my seat as it relates to their relationship because things are super complicated. Obviously, I've mentioned the plot line as both these people have survived horrors that the Empire has forced upon them. Azorian is kind of a prince to his people and upon his escape he wants to reclaim his birthright which is to basically lead his tribe from his evil devious cousin. To do this he needs our other main character Galeen because fire mages are like uh revered amongst his people and so he basically kidnaps her to help him reclaim his birthright and then he's going to like bring her back to her people. He resents and understands the situation and, and I think that's what's so interesting about that dynamic between these two characters. It's like they have empathy but they still maintain their own feelings too and it's so good. Complicated for her because her whole job and position as a fire mage for her community is that she takes on the violence and pain to protect everyone else which is horrible and she's forced to do this, but she still feels the duty to do this and to return home. And they've now arrived in his home and seeing them kind of assimilate back into like normal everyday life while still pursuing the political realities of this landscape have been great. The slow plotting of their relationship founded in mutual respect and appreciation for each other has been great, but there's still so much keeping them apart. It's duty because they both still feel their pull to be who they need to be to others. And it's like, ah, oh, it's so good. It's so heartbreaking in that way. Fantasy aspects of this, so good. And the pacing in the romance is so good. So anyway, I'm gonna obviously read more later. I need to get back to making lunch. I've let it sit now for quite a long time, but I've read well under the 200 page mark. I'm gonna finish this book today. I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna shift to another book by this author or continue on with book two of the series. Well, TBD, TBD. And lunch served. Taking some afternoon coffee and it's about to start pouring down rain I think. I got this phone notification. It wasn't supposed to rain at all this afternoon then it suddenly got gloomy and a severe storm is on the way which is very Texas core. So it seems to me the perfect opportunity to get some reading in. We did in fact get some rain which has been great ambiance for my book. As I said I am unwell. <laughs> also also I feel dumb and a little robbed. It's like, yay, I love these characters. I get to follow them over three books, you know? I'm only in book one, I got time. No, 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 I was, this series follows um, kind of a classic romance structure where there are two more books and there might even be more books, but they follow new characters just set in the same world and empire. 
So <laughs> I need to prepare myself that this book is ending and I'm not okay. But also that excites me because I feel like it'll be easier for me to feature and chat about because I'll be following new characters, new plot line, new storylines, all of those things. But my faves, my faves. I'm so close to finishing this book. I finished. <laughs> I read 388 pages of The Phoenix of Mound and loved every single second of it. It was the perfect mix of romance, fantasy, there was action, there was politics, there was great side characters. It was so romantic. The romance was so believable. Everything culminated in such an intense fashion. I was on the edge of my seat. I mean, I read this book in basically 24 hours. I could not put it down. I cried. Like, I just feel like it it entertained like I honestly went into this book with lower expectations than it even delivered like I was like I don't even need it to be that serious I just want to like like the romance like the characters enough it can be cheesy whatever I just want to read something that'll be relatively entertaining and it exceeded my expectations like don't get me wrong this isn't the most the pinnacle of literature and maybe elements of it are a little cheesy but honestly I don't even care like I flew through this. I loved the main pairing so much. I loved the writing style. I loved how this author crafted and created this world. I loved that she stayed true to the genre and the way that the characters talk to one another. Like it was modern in its romantic approach, but not modern in its language and its stylization. And it was just so good. <laughs> I don't think I have liked a romance fantasy book this much and it also it like it had it's interesting because I would say like I don't even know what I'm trying to say like it could have just been a romance and I would have loved it but it actually had like an interesting logical well plotted fantasy plot line like yes she could have spent a lot more time featuring the fantasy elements and she kind of condensed a lot of it but in the structure of the book it didn't really bother me and I feel like what she did include was like smartly done, logical, well-written, not over the top. <sighs> All that to say, <laughs> I'm gonna start book two tonight. Um, there's still a lot of questions at the end of book one as it relates to the empire and like the next steps of the politics, the danger, this world. But I do know in book two, I imagine those things will continue to develop. We're going to follow another set of main characters which is kind of fun to continue to work on the politics of this fantasy world but approach it one from a different angle like different characters who have different politics or like connections and allows us to experience another romance which is pretty fun um it's very much using like romance series mechanics but adding a fantasy flair in my opinion to great success the next one the dragon unleashed and if you're wondering if I'm going to read it, the answer is I already have it on my Kindle. I'm making milkshakes. It's been a really long time since I've made a milkshake, but it just felt right. Ah! No, it's soft enough for me. Okay. But I do just need another glass. Okay, I'll Thank you. Bring on. Cheers. I picked two large of glasses, but that's okay. Nothing a little bit of whipped cream can't fix. Now we're gonna go watch Hospital Playlist. Like hospital Playlist break. The first love of my life before I found a romantic series I actually like. But now I'm in bed with my Kindle. And things are about to get very serious because we're starting book two. Hello, good morning. I ate some oatmeal. It was delicious. It doesn't look as delicious now. But I'm also happy to report I have read 75 pages of my next book, The Dragon Unleashed. The cool thing about this series is that politically speaking, it takes place directly after the end of the first book, but it basically just pivots the story where we're following new primary character point of views, which is quite fun because it allows for a lot of the dynamics that we were introduced to of the world to persist and the story to persist, but we get to follow it from another angle and also follow new characters like from a primary point of view because we've actually been introduced to the main female protagonist already in book one but in this book we're primarily following the characters Malachis and Halani and Halani we were introduced to in book one she's part of this 
trading caravan that are kind of also like mildly criminal like they trade in things that are maybe not like guild approved she's also a successful healer like she's really good at healing um and she and her mother have been a part of this caravan her whole life it also is hinted at that she has some type of magic which i don't have a lot of details on but i'm sure will be explored the other main character we follow is malicus i think that's how you say his name and he is a draga in hiding which the concepts of draga have been introduced to us in book one they're basically like dragons but they haven't been seen in the land for like a long long time and our main character malicus is a draga but he has been trapped in a human body now for centuries i want to say and basically the only way for him to reclaim his like draga heritage and body is to find this artifact that's been imbued with his power and he has been like roaming the land trying to find it tracking it down for a very long time, let's just say. And let's also just say Halani and her people have come across this artifact in an unlikely fashion. And that's kind of how they come crashing into each other's lives. But there's like a larger plot at play too, because the evil empress who we also know from book one, she's terrible, is interested in finding a Draga because of their possible healing qualities. And she has sent people out to like track and hunt this person down. So it's like, there's lots of layers and drama and um, conspiracy surrounding these characters. But so far, 75 pages in, it's really been about establishing the new plot, reintroducing us to this world, introducing us to Halani and Malachi separately so we can get a sense of their personalities. Halani is more reserved, um, but also she's like very comfortable in her own power and talents, which I like. She loves her mother who she kind of does have a reversed role in terms of caretaking with her mother. And I think that's a really interesting and insightful storyline to include. She's just really likable. And I loved her when I had her in short bursts in the first book. So I'm excited that she's included as like center stage star in the second book. Malicus, he's kind of a grumpy guy, which makes sense. Like he does not like humankind. Well, he doesn't like most of humankind. He sometimes gets involved with them, sometimes pulls away. He's just trying to find this artifact so he can go on his merry way, but humanity keeps stealing it from him and also like preventing him from just living his life. So obviously he has some animosity towards them. He also has Malicus magic and kind of runs into a prophecy where he sees Halani and he's like what is up with that I don't care about humans at all again something I just really appreciate about this author's writing it's not this like instant carnal desire that like sweeps between characters they're really just like living l-i-v-i-n-g and they come across this person they're like why are you here i'm not interested in this i like my life and things sort of begin to develop from there but it allows them to have normal thoughts and it makes it not horrible to be in male point of view's heads to put it full frank and honesty like it's just, wow, what a change, what a change. But I'm liking this so far. I'm curious if I'm gonna like this as much as the first one. I feel like the first one's a hard act to follow because I just loved them so much. But I still think I'm gonna like this and be entertained. But like, who knows, maybe this will be my favorite of the bunch. So 75 pages really captured my attention. Truly this series is like everything I would want in a romanticy. Good enough fantasy, a good writing style, actually endearing and hypnotic romances between main characters that are well paced. I mean, I don't even have a hint of romance yet. I'm 20% in. If I was reading, yeah, 21% into this book, there hasn't even been a hint of romance. That's how I like it, guys. That's how I like it. What can I say? Anyway, I need to get changed. I made homemade cinnamon rolls for a sponsored real post and honestly they turned out pretty good i've never made homemade cinnamon rolls before i'll link the recipe down below someone yell at me if i forget but i also did make about a million dishes <laughs> which i don't have time to deal with right now ah well time to eat another cinnamon roll instead it's dinner time we're making a stir fry i'm first just going to prep the chicken but i have so many vegetables that need to be used that a stir fry is necessary. Vegetables galore. And then I also have some chicken. And stir fry is done. Good morning. Obviously, I'm having a cinnamon roll. And not to be dramatic, but these are pretty good. It was a lot of work, but also like not that hard at the same time. Would definitely do again. Just for the lack of update yesterday, Transparently, 
I didn't really read anything. It was not my best day at life, at living, at existing. But today's a new day and I have cinnamon rolls. So things are looking up. So I'll definitely have a reading update later because I'm really liking this second book. I feel like the tone of it, well, I feel like the character dynamic, obviously, is going to be very different because it's not enemies to lovers like the first one is. This one gives more reluctant supernatural creature amongst humans. Doesn't want to be there, but like someone too much to leave. Plus they're being hunted by this third character that we do have a POV from, which is a shift also from the first book, which I'm liking. Asin who doesn't even want to be hunting them, but he's being, he's being blackmailed. So complicated. Anyway, I'm really liking it though. It's reading fast. You guys already know. Happy Friday. Hello everyone, it's time for an afternoon cup of coffee. I owe y'all a reading update. Sorry, please. I think the mailman's here. Um, hold on. But I owe y'all a reading update because I have around 150 pages of The Dragon Unbound and I have feelings. Hello, I'm here with a reading update. I have read to page 170 of The Dragon Unbound. Right off the bat, I still think I like the first book in this series more. But that's also, again, quick reminder, I basically feel like I'm gonna give that book five out of five stars. This book is still really good and the strengths of Grace Draven are continuing to shine, but let's talk more about this plot. So obviously, again, we're following Malachus, who is a Draga and hiding in human form, and Hanali, who is a healer and part of this trading caravan who we were introduced to previously. These two characters, okay, so the, the setup, I guess like tropey parts of this book is that like he was injured and she's healing him. So like he's recovering and that's how they kind of have come to spend a lot of quality time together because otherwise they wouldn't have crossed paths. They wouldn't be sharing this time. But we also know that Malachus has seen Hanali like in his vision and his Draga visions to find his lost artifact. He needs to reclaim his power and body. And we know reading Hanali's chapters that her like trade leader, like her caravan leader has found this artifact and she knows that it's important to him, but she doesn't know why. Um, and she knows that her caravan leader, despite her warnings, despite what she says they should do, is gonna go into the capital city to sell it. And she's supposed to hang back with kind of the end of the caravan to kill time and keep him occupied before he goes off to continue like hunting for this item. There's drama and conflict with that, but obviously the scale of the politics in comparison to the first one are much smaller. I mean, there was a lot the author packed in in book one. Ceremonies of sacrifice, a character going back to his homeland to reclaim his seat of power, but he had to like wrestle it from someone else. Rebellion and war, like there's so much stuff that happened in book one. And there was also, um, because there was just like a lot of conflict. Um, the way that the author paced out the romance was differently. I would say how Hanali and Malachus, particularly Malachus, like feels towards Hanali has sh made itself apparent sooner. But that doesn't mean I feel like the author is like rushing her pacing. I really like how this author does romantic pacing. One just does a service to both of her characters and making them like, endearing and likable and everything is like so kind and I like Malachus as a character and there's humor in it too because he's not human and he doesn't spend a lot of time around humans so how he interacts with people is just different he's like more honest more blunt but like not cruel just direct and how he speaks is a little different how he approaches things are a little different and I like one, his personality, but I also like the dynamic of how he sometimes catches Hanali off guard and also vice versa. And their dynamic is just like really sweet to read. And he's nice to her from the beginning. Like there's no, like, I don't know, like trying to play it cool or anything like that. Like it's this nice, sweet, quiet romance yeah. and care and moment of characters like coming together and learning about each other, getting to know each other. And in that, like possibly growing feelings for one another, but it's like a slow burn and it's really sweet. And I also just love how the author, like she respects the intensity of like, a handhold or like an accidental brushing of arms or like like how she escalates things is so good and keeps you on the edge of your seat she clearly respects romance like the feelings of love like the growth of feelings in general and it's just a joy to read obviously the scale of this book is less the drama that kind of brought our characters together in the first one like isn't as intensely there but like there's definitely things there 
um, particularly with this stolen artifact that's like fundamental to one of our main characters' life and existence and Hanali's decision to kind of be complicit in keeping this secret. But other than that, I just love how they speak to one another. And it shows that you can have a slow burn without them being like cruel senselessly to one another for them to have that flip flop. Like you can have two characters that are just like nice and respectful and friendly and intrigued with one another and still slowly build that connection and romance and care. And I love Hanalee's relationship with her mom and even like getting to see insight into the relationships within this caravan. Like I really enjoy how this author writes and I just, it really shows good fantasy romance forward writing. Like this is definitely romance forward, but still a well, like constructed fantasy landscape for things to unfurl in. God, it's so good. Take it back, she's torturing me. <laughs> Two characters destined to meet each other for a brief moment to then have to separate because of their own obligations and duties to their own life. <sighs> they share stories. He's teaching her to read. It's too much. Cheers, friends. Happy Sunday. And this is going to be an exciting Sunday because we are marathoning to finish out this blog. I'm gonna be finishing this book and reading an entirely additional book by this author to close out this vlog and to close out this day because I got the day off. What else am I doing besides being in sweatpants and reading romance books? But let's also do a reading update. So I am 70% done with The Dragon Unleashed by Grace Stravin. And I am liking this book quite a bit. I'm not liking it as much as the first one, but again, I've mentioned a few times, I feel like that one will be hard to top. It's definitely steaming, the drama is beginning to rise. This was, I would also describe kind of a bit of a slow burn, not just in the romance, but well, actually less in the romance. I feel like the first book was a little bit more of a, a slow burn. This book was definitely more two people who immediately had chemistry, came crashing into each other's lives, but they both knew that it was going to be like, temporary which i think creates the tension in like a different way but the central plot and like fantasy mystery is starting to heat up and the complications that is existing between these two characters outside of this like knowing parting has also really increased and this sort of draga legacy the hunt for this draga artifact everything's sort of coming to a head in this in a very like oh god fashion whereas before i would say this book was really not like lovely to read like there was still drama i mean it was lovely to read but there was still like drama but it was like slower paced really enjoying watching our characters get to know each other but now things are really getting complicated quickly and i just really like Grace Draven's romances, as I've said numerous times, but I also like how the characters in this series communicate because like there's conflict that exists within both of these books I've read, but both the conflict is like, it's not just that it's reasonable, but the reason why characters are mad or not revealing the whole truth, like you can understand their thought process as to why it's not just some like artificially created drama for the third act of a romance book. Like the drama that exists in the third act of both of these series, both of these books that I've read have both been like looming. We knew they were coming and so do our characters. And we also understand why our characters acted as they did within that. And it just makes the whole thing like much more like, oh gosh, I need to see what's going to happen next. Cause it's not just some like stupid contrived misunderstanding that you're just like trying to like get through, you know? But the fantasy part is definitely increasing. I'm liking this. I like Hanali, I like Malachus. I like Malachus cause he's like slightly not human. And I think that's like a fun dynamic. I like how direct he is. I like how forthright he is with his feelings good, bad, like all of those things. I think it's kind of like nice to see a male character who is like willing to just share what's on his mind, what's on his heart, you know? Good for Malachus, he's gone to therapy. <laughs> but um, I'm gonna sit down and finish this now. And then I think I'm gonna start a third book, as I mentioned, and it's going to be the first book to another series by this author to kind of give perhaps a little variety, but it's still romance, <laughs> so how much variety i don't know but i'm liking this quite a bit and i think i'm just like saving the third book that's out for a rainy day because i am liking this series so much i'm just like shook by this whole experiment shout out to grace draven other news i need to make a quick lunch <laughs> and i don't really feel like doing anything that remotely looks like cooking so i'm going to make 
wait for it. Pizza rolls. Trusty, trusty pizza rolls. How could one go wrong? I'm just gonna lick the rest of them. Cheers. It's time to eat these pizza rolls. My puzzle board when I need my coffee table. Um, I'm gonna eat these pizza rolls and also catch up on Survivor. Hi friends, caught up on Survivor. Pizza rolls are consumed, so we're gonna sit down now and read The Dragon Unleashed. I have about an hour and a half left of this according to my Kindle. And I always love to race my Kindle time remaining. I'm like, I can beat you, you don't know me. Um, so I'm gonna sit down and read it now. I feel like I'll definitely one shot it because where I'm at, it's just like, there's so much happening. and I need to know how the whole thing is going to wrap up. So we will see. And I just, I want Hanalei and Malikus to be okay. Hi friends, I'm here because I finished The Dragon Unleashed and it was so good. My, I'm just, I'm having a great time. I will stand by, I didn't like it as much as the first one, but one thing it did do is that it entwined characters that I definitely know are gonna be featured in book three. And not to say that Hanalei was, she, Hanalei was in book one, but like we got more characters uh, point of view chapters they were just kind of more present so I, I'm looking forward to reading book three soon and just how everything wrapped up I just really feel like this is the perfect balance of like very very romance but actually compelling fantasy plot line I've been going on and on and on I honestly think I'd give this book like four stars I had a blast um so that's done and then from there friends I already started <laughs> my next book my Kindle froze. <laughs> but the book I started is The Master of Crows, which this is another Enemies to Lovers first book to a series by this author. This also came out though in Millie really Wants Dinner, uh, 2009. So I'm curious if it's going to be a little bit different, maybe showing the time period and the age a bit more. It's also one of her more earlier <laughs> releases. So it'll be interesting to compare and contrast. Based on what I've read so far, I can also see that this might not land for everyone because the main male character is kind of a jerk, but like a pompous intellectual jerk who uses his meanness to keep people from becoming close to him based off of his complicated past sort of thing. You get the idea. Right, my camera died, so we've switched to my phone. But the setup of Master of Crows is basically, we are reading again from a dual POV, which again, I like, because we're allowed to live in both of our characters' point of views. The first character we're introduced to is Martise, and she is um, a slave to a very powerful, like, magician organization. And she basically is given an opportunity to get her freedom. If she acts as a spy, because she's sent to this, like, supposedly very dangerous magician's tower and she's supposed to spy on him for this powerful magician's enclave to basically find proof that he is a traitor to the realm so they can like get rid of him because they don't like him because he's kind of a renegade if you will she isn't interested in doing this but also views it as like she needs she will do anything obviously to get out of the empire's thumb she's an interesting character because she's definitely more reserved and quiet but that doesn't mean she's weak uh the author does a really great job showcasing her being really good at hiding her emotions, keeping her emotions under check so she would be a really good person to be a spy because of this. But again, her quietness is not weakness. I like her dynamic, especially in contrast, Solara, who is the main male lead, who is definitely like, as I said, kind of a jerk. He kind of gives like Damon Salvatore vibes, like I'm so mean to keep people away from me and like protect you from me sort of thing. It's a little overwrought, but I'm not gonna lie, I am eating it up. He's basically a recluse that lives in this tower with just him and his like assistant bodyguard type character. He kind of gives like Hal vibes, like he's very eccentric and he's like very powerful, but he is removed from society. So like our main character Martise is here, like she's trying to find out information. He also knows that she is here probably to get information on him. So he's like not interested in interacting with her in any way, shape and form because he assumes that she is a tool for the empire, but they're both like being used by the empire, which is like an interesting dynamic. It's there. You do notice almost right away, like he does not want to like her or be talking to her or have to be around her at all, but she's constantly like kind of surprised surprising him which it's funny to be in his head because he's like such a jerk and it's almost like he's trying to convince himself in his own brain that she's uninteresting 
to him, which again is kind of why Ryan reminds me of Damon Salvatore, but also why I think this book wouldn't be for everyone because the main male lead, again, he's not as like charming as the last two books I have read. So there's that, but it is enemies to lovers. So there's definitely some enemies at play here. Another large part of this book is that our main character has magic but it's like locked and she doesn't know why no one else knows why and so they're like working together as like part of the agreement with the enclave to like train her in magic or like figure out what's going on with her magic you see what i mean a lot of setup but the main thing is two people who don't like each other living in a reclusive house working on magic trying to unlock secrets of the empire we'll see how this whole thing plays out you know what i mean so that is where we're at and now i'm in my third romance book this week and at this point, I feel like I'm slowly losing my mind, <laughs> but in a good way. But yeah, I'll keep you all posted. I feel like I'll be able to read this today, no problem. It's not as good as the other two books, but I'm reading it faster because I feel like she's playing into some tropes that like, even if I'm rolling my eyes in this one, like I also like want to read what's going to happen next. So take that with what you will. Hi friends, I have a reading update. I have passed 150 pages of this book. One thing I will say about Master of Crows is that it reads so fast and the tension that exists between the two main characters is really good. And it's definitely leaning probably the most into enemies to lovers than I read for like the first book of this vlog. Like these two characters have a lot of animosity towards each other. But despite that, it's like, you feel like every time you're reading their points of views, they're trying to talk themselves out of liking the other person, which does create like a lot of fun and a lot of tension. There's some quite likable side characters, particularly Silhara's, Silhara's like assistant bodyguard. He's silent because he can't speak, but he's definitely not silent because he makes his opinions, thoughts known. He's really funny. I really like the relationship between him and Silhara and also the relationship that's forming separately between him and Martise. I like how this author always gives time and attention to like side character relationships to be formed. I think it makes the whole story feel a lot more full and interesting. Obviously we have this conclave mystery and Martise's magic mystery. On the one hand, like Martise's magic is locked and we don't know why. And on the other hand, there's some sort of like conclave evil God that's trying to like win over Silhara to like give in to become evil and the conclave like basically is trying to figure out if the god is reaching out to him which is why our other main character Martise is there. It's kind of convoluted, it's kind of complicated, but it's also pretty straightforward in that, you know, they're all in this tower together working together, but like the star of the show is the dynamic between Martise and Silhara. And I will say it's not gonna be for everyone. Like he grates on my nerves and I wish he was nicer. And I do feel like Grace Draven wouldn't write it like this now, but in a way it reads, to me, this is much more like romance novel vibes because it's very isolated. It reminds me like very much of some like Tessa Dare books I've read, but it's fantasy too, you know? Quick oatmeal intermission. Also catching up a little bit on the traitors. My Kindle's finally working. Uh, but anyway, Matilda and I are gonna sit down and do more reading because I am nearing the 200 page mark. So things are getting interesting. Actually, before I read more, let me do an update. It's really funny. Like, I feel like I'm laughing the most in this one of the three, even though this is by far my least favorite couple. The plot is pretty straightforward. Like it really is. Martise is spying. Selhara, powerful wizard, knows Martise is spying on him, but whatever, it's not a big deal. He needs the money from the um, other wizard, so he's like letting it slide, which is kind of a funny scenario because she feels bad that she's doing it, uh, but he knows all along, so it's just kind of like a funny dynamic. I will say this book also is much steamier than the other books. There's been a couple scenes where I'm literally like, what is going on? Like, all the world building that has taken place hasn't felt info dumpy and for the most part has been logical enough where I'm like, all right, cool, let's keep going with this romance story. Like I don't need it, but I enjoy that it's there. I also appreciate that there is actually quite a few like domestic scenes. There's lots of like eating around a table, going out and working the orange trees, making perfume, going into town and like selling your wares. Like as much as it is about magic and there is this like all powerful wizard character, there's like these very like wholesome, sweet, everyday, cozy, vibey sort of scenes to go alongside of it. Plus, of course, as I said, the spicy scenes 
too. The dynamic Silhara is still a jerk. He's a likable jerk, but I will say I wish he was a little softer to Martise. And now, especially that I'm kind of like starting to be on the other side of this romance, like in the, in the beginning, I was like, well, you know, it's enemies to lovers. He's like trying to convince himself about it. But now like, we're kind of just veering into the lovers part. And I just wish he was like, I understand she's not going to completely change his personality. Like he's kind of a know it all sort of individual and Martise inherently is like a little more quiet, but she still has strength too. And I just wish there's maybe a bit more balance between that dynamic. And I mean, there's still time for it to be fixed. A lot better than a lot of other romantic books I've read, if I'm being honest. Sorry guys, I feel like this vlog is so long. <laughs> I'm really sleepy, but I've reached the 80% mark of Master of Crows. Um, I will say, I feel like I devoured the first 50% of this book, but the second half of this book, I will say I have not liked as much. Um, I Stand By This feels much more like a traditional romance setup. And I think I see that more, especially in the second half, because where the other two books I read had a pretty interesting plot that began to really develop in the second half, which really propelled our characters through. There is a heat up in the plot in this, but it's still primarily centered on the characters and their relationship and aspects of their relationship for me personally have gotten a little repetitive. And I think as the enemies aspects has, as the enemy aspect has melted away, parts of their dynamic has graded on me like a little bit as i mentioned before the the drama that is existing like the third act drama plot line between our two characters to me isn't as interesting as what we've encountered in other books by this author i still think it's worth the read especially if you like this author but i wouldn't maybe start here i would start with the other series i mentioned first hi friends and welcome to the end of the vlog the next day i will keep this brief because i know i've gone on and on and on and on in this vlog but i've officially finished my third and final book for this romance readathon sort of situation which also means i read over 1200 pages let's quickly wrap up everything i was able to complete because again i read three books the first thing i read the first two books to the fallen empire series the first one being the phoenix and bound which is an enemies to lovers story that i adored five out of five stars the tension the mutual respect the pining that existed between these two characters in combination with the compelling fantasy plot line was everything i could have ever wanted which is why i read the direct sequel which is the dragon unleashed which i also really enjoyed a different romantic dynamic but still one that had pining and tension which i feel like grace draven just has a great talent for particularly creating that within a traditional fantasy setting i really enjoyed her writing style and just how she was able to combine like a decent fantasy plot line and romance that I personally was very endeared to. And then obviously the third and final book I was able to complete, which I will touch on quickly, is The Master of Crows. I gave the first two books five stars and four stars respectively and really, really, really loved. This book I liked, but definitely had some problems with it. The first 50%, um, I ate up, I'm not gonna lie. I felt like the trope usage of this book was entertaining enough that I was able to kind of look past some of my issues in combination with, I do feel like Grace Draven's skill for banter and creating like characters getting to know each other first, which then creates feeling was still very much at the heart of the story, which is why I liked it. There was some interesting choices made in the second half of this book, which kind of was like, pulled me out of it a little bit. And the second half, I also would say got a little repetitive and the character dynamics graded on me a bit more. Some of the magical lore was also a little weird. Um, a lot of it was cool. Some of it I was like, where are we going with this, Grace? But I would say if you like Grace Draven, you probably would still enjoy this book. It just wouldn't necessarily be where I would recommend to start, which I think I already flagged. But yes, that is the end of my very first episode of deep diving on a romantic author to see if they're for me. 1200 pages were read, lots of fangirling was experienced. And I think in the case of Grace Draven, she is for me. And I will be checking out other books by her in the future and we'll be tracking all of her new releases. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you soon with another one soon. Goodbye.